This is what is known as Transfiguration Sunday. Those passages reflect both the shared story of uh, Elijah and Elisha and the transformation of Elijah as he went up into heaven and Jesus' transformation on the mountaintop. And it's, I suppose both of those stories really are talking to us about our faith and how it can transform even us. That's how we think of those passages when we read them centuries later. I remember when I was studying theology, riding on the subway one morning on my way to class, and I was reading the Confessions of St. Augustine. It was really bright, cheery reading for the morning commute. But I have to say, there was a section of it that I was reading, it was describing his transformative moment. Uh, he had been, uh, as many saints, uh, started out in a noble family and felt that all the experiences of his life really left him feeling empty, and so he found a new direction in his life through his faith. And so exuberant was he this one particular morning when he had a transforming moment that he literally threw off all his clothes and went dancing down the streets. And I can remember looking up from my book at my fellow morning commuters and thinking, there's no way that's ever going to happen to me. <laughs> nope. Nope, 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 nope. No transforming moment's going to happen for me here. Thank you very much. But sometimes for some people, that is what can happen in their lives of faith, that transforming moment. And it can come in so many different ways. But today we're looking at Brene Brown and her sense of what can be transformative moments in our lives. And we're looking at her guidepost about cultivating laughter, song, and dance, and any of us know who have experienced those moments in our lives that they can be transforming in and of themselves. When I was growing up, I would often go to visit my grandmother at her apartment in Weston, which is just West Toronto, and there was no backyard to play in, <coughs> no vegetable patch to explore, uh, no tree swing, no trunk in the attic of dress-up clothes, no cookies to bake or preserves to put down, so not the typical grandmother visit. <coughs> Mine was an urban grandmother, and an outing might consist of a walk down the street to the Kresge's store on Lawrence and Eglinton for an ice cream at the soda bar, and perhaps if I was lucky, a string of suckers to take home. We'd sometimes stop at the Loblaws with me pulling her grocery cart along the busy sidewalk, and when we got back to her apartment, up the elevator and into her suite, we'd unpack the groceries together. And I always associate the smell of ripe bananas with my grandmother's apartment. We'd put the kettle on, grab a digestive cookie from the cooking jar, which was the shape of a blonde girl's head with no bonnet, the lid had broken years ago, so she used a margarine lid instead. <laughs> We'd watch Days of Our Lives, The Young and the Restless. I love when I got bored with some of the episodes. I'd sort of disappear into the corner of her living room, and I'd like to rearrange the fake birds that she had perched in a little <laughs> bird cage that was like this tall, and that was kind of my amusement till Young and the Restless ended. Then the real fun would start. We'd pull out the shoe box of kid stuff that she kept in her front hall closet next to the box that held the tinsel tree, the one that you'd shine the colored light that would rotate and it would like do this miraculous change of color. In it were a few game pieces, a skipping rope, a set of those plastic cones that when you flipped the trigger, a ping pong ball would come shooting out and we'd stand facing each other about five feet apart in her living room, trying to volley the ping pong ball back and forth between the two of us. Well, you can imagine we'd be in hysterics in no time. Now, my grandmother uh, as, was as round as she was tall, so this was really quite an athletic feat for her. And by the end of this game, we, two of us would just be weak with laughter, and I can still see the two of us collapsing on her sofa in hysterics with the tears streaming down our cheeks as we howled side by side. She had the nickname Weezer, because that's usually what she'd start to do if she got really carried away with her laughing. 
Now, I don't often laugh quite like that anymore. Or at least as adults, we don't do it enough. When we're kids, we'd often go into hysterics over something or another. As young children, we learn to stop being so silly. We're told to stop being so childish and act like a grown-up. Which really, when you think of it, is that a stupid thing to say to a child or what? <laughs> that kind of childlike fun, curiosity, tends to be curbed or discouraged. Now, I remember traveling to Scotland when I was a teenager and walking through Edinburgh. I was in the downtown area, kind of the business section, and, but I was aware of the teens who were dressed in black jeans, Doc Martens. They had that spiked hair that was tinted bright colors, pierced noses or lips. And then I, I was just like so taken aback by them. Like I, I thought, wow, that's, boy, they're really out there. And then I observed some of the young adults who were maybe a few years older than this crazy crew I was watching, and they were all dressed in gray suits and neckties, carrying briefcases. And I thought to myself, you know, it's as if the teenagers knew how they'd have to conform when they got older. So they were letting all their crazy, wild, expressive selves out before they'd have to shut down all that personality and unique self-expression. But I still to this day wonder how you transform from that one to the next. I don't know. Sometimes as adults, as Brene Brown suggests, we tend to feel it's important to maintain control, to hold on to our emotions, to be cool, hey, collect it. But it is proven that laughter is the best medicine. To dance and sing is good for our health, and you don't need to be a ballerina or an opera singer to benefit from it. You just need to pick up your feet or take a breath. The benefits are the same whether you have two left feet or you're tone deaf. Brene Brown believes that laughter, song, and dance are all essential to our soul care. Do you know, Reverend John and I heard a story this week from somebody here in the congregation, I won't give away their anonymity, but they told us that they love to dance. And they even have shoes, tap dance shoes, that they bring out once in a while. And they've danced all over the world, they, and they've done tango lessons, and, they've, and the person, I'm not going to give their identity away, but it is not anyone that you would think. So there you go. Now you're all going to be curious. <laughs> so why do we stop feeling free to laugh and dance and sing? I was so impressed that this person held on to their love of dancing and that they would take any opportunity that they could to dance. I think sometimes it's because we're afraid of being seen as foolish. Or for some of us, we've done something once that someone else commented on and we felt foolish, even betrayed. That feeling of shame and embarrassment is what stops us from feeling free to express ourselves in the future. When I was in high school, I remember a grade 11 student got the lead in our production of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. She played Puck, which is a very outgoing, pixie kind of like character. And the director said he knew that he had his lead right from the audition. And you might think, wow, she must have nailed it to get that lead part. But in fact, while auditioning, she was wearing a skirt and a blouse, and her slip fell to her ankles right in the middle of her audition. And rather than stop, she just stepped out of the fallen slip, tossed it off stage, and kept going without missing a beat. Her composure so impressed the director that she got the lead. The gifts of imperfection. I might have felt so mortified that I would have run off the stage in embarrassment and never attempted another play for the rest of my life. We often care so much about what other people think that we might stop ourselves from doing things that we might truly love or that give us joy. So Brene Brown asks that if we believe laughter, song, and dance are essential to our soul care, do you hear that? It's essential to our soul care. How do we make sure we hold space for them in our lives? How do we let go of that self-control 
and let loose once in a while. Now, I know many of you wives are shaking your heads and you're saying, Galen, please don't say that. Don't give my husband any more ideas. But how do we let go of worrying about what other people might think? How can we avoid shaming others when they are trying to express joy and laughter or to try something new that might be life-giving for them? What do you do to bring laughter, song, or dance into your lives? Have you ever noticed that to watch a comedy is not nearly as fun if you're watching it alone as if you watch it with someone else? When you laugh, you look to others around you and laugh more heartily together than if you were by yourself. And colleagues have commented that when you sing with a group, such as when we sing here at church on a Sunday morning, that there is actually a shared energy that we all benefit from by singing together. Doesn't matter if you're untuned or not. It's just that shared joy of expressing yourself. And of course, dancing is always so much more fun in a group than solo. I remember attending a wedding that I conducted of a cousin related to me through my birth mother. And at the reception, all the women were dancing in a circle to We Are Family. You know that great tune? And we took turns partnering up with different people in the center of the circle as all of the others clapped and cheered us along. I was both mortified and gratified when one of my relatives grabbed my hand and led me into the middle of the circle to everyone's cheers and clapping. I felt so welcomed and accepted as part of the family, and it meant so much to me. I would never have done that on my own initiative, but because someone reached out to me, I was able to participate in that fun. Part of sharing the laughter and dance and song is about being hospitable and welcoming to all, especially those who might feel on the fringe of our community or gathering. Think even about coffee time. We sit and laugh and joke with our friends, but are we always aware of someone that might be kind of wandering around wondering which table they might fit in and where they might feel welcome? We have to be intentional about recognizing that not everyone feels invited to the dance. Not everyone has the courage to sing out or let loose without some encouragement. And most importantly, when someone risks being themselves, joining in the dance or sharing some laughter, not to shame them or make them feel embarrassed by, the, by a rude comment or a rolling of our eyes. It's more an expression of our own insecurities than the actual actions of the other person, I think, that make us do that kind of thing. So, are you ready? Let's give it a try. Let's have some fun for a few moments in a place that you might feel you have to be controlled and properly behaved. I'm giving you permission. Yes, we have to respect this space of worship. But worship doesn't always mean somber tones or expressions. The psalms are filled with words of song and dancing and laughter as a way of praising God. And don't worry, I don't have tap shoes enough for everyone. It is God's spirit, though, that I believe that can fill us with joy and life. And what better way to express God than to be filled with so much joy that we have to express it some way whether by song or dance or laughter. So it just bubbles up inside us. Now, have I got you all just reasonably worried and stressed right now? <laughs> Brene Brown says that laughter, song, and dance are all essential to our soul care, so let's do a little soul care. That's what we're going to do right now. So take a deep breath. Just take your arms, just shake them out a little bit. Just relax here. It's not going to be a bad thing. We are going to play musical beach ball okay that's what we're gonna do and Andrew's gonna lead us with music and when the music is playing you have to pass the beach ball around and when the music stops whoever's got the beach ball you're gonna hold it and you're gonna read one of the passages you see it's biblical so it's okay all right it, that's the stamp of approval it's okay all right, so are we ready, Andrea? And who, we've got some young people here. We still have, may, would you maybe be able to help if we need it? Are you feeling energetic? If the ball happens to go astray, 
can you help collect it up again so we can keep it going? Have we got, did I see, I think. Don't forget the choir. Oh, and the choir, yes, I know. Shall we start with the choir? <laughs> Let's do that, here we go. And I'll, I'll guard it from the candles, okay? Don't worry, relax, it's okay. We're just gonna have fun, we're letting loose here. This is okay. All right, Andrea, ready. Oh, all right. Okay, I'm going to borrow this microphone here for a second so, so you can read out loud for us what we've got, the words we've got today. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. And there's that from? Proverbs 17, 22. There you see, it's biblical. All right. Music maestro. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, I gotta go around here. Here we go. With laughter, our tongue sang for joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. From Psalm 126, verse 2. Excellent, thank you. When the music starts, you can talk to it. <laughs> oh, you want to go around there? Oh, good. Oh, oh, look. there you go. Oh, here we go. There we go. Let's see. Did we read this one yet? There we go. Okay, how about Heather? Can you help with reading? Which one have we not read yet? Blessed are you who are hungry now. Oh, right into the mic if you can. Sorry. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who were who weep now, for you shall laugh. Luke 6, verse 21. All right, thank you. So did anyone hear that? Blessed are you who are hungry now, you shall be satisfied. And blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. So I just want to remember that, yes, laughter and joy is important, but we all know that there are those sad times as well. But the hope is that even in the midst of that sadness, there's the promise of joy and laughter. Okay. All right, well, one more. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, you got the last one there. <laughs> there we go. Is there one? Okay. God will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. And that's from Job 8, 21. All right, thank you. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. All right, we could just keep doing this all morning, couldn't we? Whew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See, no one was struck by lightning yet. See, it's okay to have a little bit of fun, and that's part of the joy. And tell me how you're feeling right now. Great. Relieved that you didn't have to read out loud, I know. But the laughter, the joy, it does something to our spirits, and that's a gift of God to us, that spirit of joy and laughter. Dear Archelin, every week when she comes, she hands Reverend John and I a little note with some passages from the Bible that she's prayed about or been inspired to share with us. And today, the passage that she handed to me, written on a little note, says, This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's from Numbers chapter six. So keep doing some soul care. Find those ways to share in some laughter 
enjoy, do a little dance in the kitchen, sing in the shower, and share that joy. And that kind of joy and laughter will be transforming, not only for your day, but for your life and to those around you. Amen.